Are we ready up there? How's everybody doing today? Good. Thank you. I uh, I really would like to invite all of you to move farther back because you're invading my personal space here. Now I have uh, I have some announcements that I am supposed to make. The first one is on your bulletin there's what they call a QR code and uh, if you I, I don't know how to do it but the explanation is that you use your phone camera and that will give you the opportunity to register is, is it true okay that's number one number two is that uh, the baby bottles for Hope Pregnancy are back here. And uh, Raleigh, are there any others besides these on the altar? Yes, sir. There's a few more okay. out here on the table. Okay. Thank you all. Well, if, if, if somebody takes the ones on the table, you can come and take the ones off of the altar. Because I know many of you look at these things on the altar and say, I sure ought to take some of that stuff home with me after church. The third thing is uh, VBS starts on June the 27th through the 30th. It's a big week around here. And so if you'd like to volunteer to be a helper or a cookie maker or a teacher or something like that, or if you're a child and you want to come, you can sign up in the atrium. And then the rest of the bulletin, there are uh, a bunch of other announcements if you'd like to read them there and you you're free to do that so I'm gonna ask who's the leader of this service are you Cameron that's what they tell me okay I call it Cameron but it's not right okay it's Nigeria anyway uh, Let's start singing instead of me talking. All right, Terry is on vacation this week with his family, and we miss them. Um, but we are still going to worship this morning, and we're glad that you are here with us. Uh, so if you will stand with us, we're going to sing Emily King Forever to start our time together this morning.
yesterday and today and forever. Um, that you defeated death, you defeated the grave. Um, and that you are always faithful. No matter where we are in our lives, that your goodness and your faithfulness remain the same. Uh, we ask that you accept our offering of worship this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. I'd like to invite uh, the children to come up and uh, visit with Miss Christie today. And uh, if you're thinking you're too little to come on your own, your mother can bring you up here if she would like.
Today, we're going to discuss and discuss and describe the Holy Spirit. I'm excited to see that you're listening so closely. We're going to discuss two of the many ways you can listen closely to the Holy Spirit. One way is to make your body still. Another way is no talking. The Holy Spirit does speak truth to us through God because God speaks through the Spirit. And God is loving, trustworthy, and truthful. The Holy Spirit always brings glory to God. When we listen to the Spirit and follow the Spirit's direction, our lives will glorify God too. When we honor God, we are glorifying God. When we praise God, we are glorifying God. When we worship God, we are glorifying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we listen to the Holy Spirit, we are listening to God. When we do that, we glorify God and show how much we love him. Let us pray. Dear God, the voice of the Spirit is so true to be a guide and give to you, speaking not on its own, but rather what is heard and shown. The Spirit tells you what life will do. What it receives from God will be shown to you. Amen. Thank you, Christy. Uh, in the insert in your worship guide, there is on one side announcements. On the other side, there are uh, there is a list of people uh, for whom we are asked to pray as a church. And so I want you to, to note that. Um, because it's something that's really important. Um, so I would ask us to pray to God silently, and then I'll finish with the pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we ask that you would find our worship, which is lifted up to you, to be acceptable in your sight. We ask you, if you would, to be merciful to us in all possible ways as we lift up our eyes to you who are enthroned in heaven. We pray that you would send your mercy down upon us. We also ask not only that we would receive your mercy, but that we might also receive your forgiveness. Some of us have very small and minor sins that we commit from time to time. Others of us are more creative in our sinning, but... Whatever is true and whatever is right, we ask that you would give us forgiveness and remind us that in you 
we always have a second chance. We ask you to deliver us as you delivered Israel so long ago and that your spirit would continue to lift us up and encourage us to be the people that you created us to be. Remind us that it is in you that we have ultimate security. And even though oftentimes it seems as if our world has gone crazy, that we know that you are in charge and that you rule and overrule. And we put our tra trust in your grace and in your mercy. And we ask that we might be steadfast in, in this attitude towards you. May we have a harvest of joy in our life and may you bless our families and our homes. We ask that our home would be a happy one of the faithful. And in all that we say and do, may we be faithful to you. We say this prayer and all of our prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught his disciples to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I would invite you, if you would, to uh, hear the day's lesson. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. For He will not speak on His own, but He will speak whatever He hears, and He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because He will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of, the God, of God for the people of God. I'm going to ask a rhetorical question now. Don't feel like you need to answer, uh, which I'm not expecting an answer. But... How would you like it if a preacher came and told you uh, the equivalent of what Jesus says to his disciples when he says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. No. Now, I don't know if I should tell you this, but most people would take that as an insult by saying, I have a lot of stuff that I could tell you, but... I'm not going to tell you because you wouldn't get it or you couldn't bear it. You couldn't uh, comprehend what I am about to do. And to almost anybody that would say that to us, except for Jesus, we would say something like, oh yeah, well, same to you. That's the way that we would respond in kind. Since it's Jesus, of course, they didn't do that. But... Uh, we don't need to fool ourselves between Jesus and the Bible and theology. They makes us scratch our heads from time to time and say, what is going on here? The Bible is just endlessly filled with things that seem, I don't know, pretty unexplainable in some ways. Uh, and yet here Jesus is telling his disciples that instead of trying to explain all this stuff to them, he just thinks they can't bear it now and that later these things will be revealed to them, presumably by the Holy Spirit. And uh, 
I don't know if I need to tell you this or not. I probably do, but today is Trinity Sunday, which always occurs the first Sunday after Pentecost, which ironically was last Sunday. So this is the following Sunday. So we have Trinity Sunday with us. And this seems like a strange text, but it's chosen specifically for Trinity Sunday because in this text, John manages to elucidate some truth about God the Father, also about the Son, Jesus, and also about the Holy Spirit. So he does that, and, and Jesus does this within the context of a four-chapter section of John's Gospel that is called Jesus' Farewell Discourse. Jesus knows he's about ready to be, uh, you know, go through all this stuff with the Sanhedrin uh, Jewish authorities, with the Roman authorities, be crucified, and, and all that business. So Jesus gives this, what we would say is farewell sermon, farewell discourse. Now, because ministers should be merciful like God, instead of reading all four chapters of John's gospel, that is Jesus' farewell discourse, we've carved out these few verses for us to talk about the whole idea of the Trinity. Farewell discourse was fairly well known about in the ancient world. Uh, when Socrates was just about ready to be killed by the Athenian citizenry, uh, he was allowed to say a few words. Of course, Socrates never says a few words. He always says a lot of words. I don't know if it was four chapters worth, but it was quite a bit. It's in Plato's dialogue that's called the Apology. And uh, the Apology doesn't mean I'm sorry. What it really means in the original Greek is a defense or an explanation. Apologia. So that is what uh, Socrates does. Uh, Plato puts the words into his mouth, but what he's doing is explaining why he did the things that he did that seem to be pretty disagreeable with the citizens of Athens. Um, a biblical example of a farewell discourse is the book of Deuteronomy. Moses gets up and he makes a speech, which happens to be 34 long, painful chapters of the book of Deuteronomy. Um, most of us couldn't take it, but uh, Moses is telling the people of Israel goodbye. They're getting ready to go into the wilderness and he's not going with them. So he makes a speech instead. Um, they were probably thinking, in around chapter seven or eight, maybe we ought to just take Moses with us and he'd stop talking. <laughs> but he didn't, he went all the way through 34 chapters. Uh, so we have both secular sort of farewell discourses, we also have uh, religious ones. Uh, the, one of the most famous farewell discourses in our country was, uh, inadvertent when Lincoln delivered his second inaugural address to the people of the United States. And then a few weeks later, he was killed in Ford's theater. So these farewell discourses come in several different ways, but one of the things that they often have in common is, first of all, they make a prophecy about the future. What is going to happen to those who um, are going to be left behind because this leader is going, you know, to die. And the second thing is that sometimes the farewell discourse is a big promise from God for the prosperity and care of the people who are being left behind. So it's sort of a good news, bad news scenario, but that's, that's what happens. 
this Sunday, just a little history, and this is from our Presbyterian friends. Uh, and there was a lady that left the first service this morning, and she kind of said, it's a good thing you didn't say anything bad about the Presbyterians. And I thought, well, why wouldn't I do that? I know you. So anyway, uh, our Presbyterian friends write this. On Trinity Sunday, we proclaim the mystery of our faith in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One in three and three in one. We, the celebration of Trinity Sunday began among Western Christians in the 10th century, 900s, and developed slowly until formally established on the Sunday after Pentecost by Pope John the 22nd. And he uh, reigned, his pontificate was 1316 to 1334. So we've had Trinity Sunday for a really long time, uh, however difficult it is to explain to people. It's a, it's, it's a difficult doctrine, and what is perplexing about our text this morning is it just seems like Jesus would have been ticking off his audience when he said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. We like to know stuff. We human beings are naturally curious people. Have uh, you ever been standing in line at the grocery store? And I can't imagine you've ever been to a grocery store if you haven't waited in line for a while. And sometimes it's just kind of interesting to listen to people talk in the line, some of the things that they say. Now, I'm always in the line with the people that say, no, you can't have a candy bar to spoil your dinner. For some reason, I'm always with those people. But I'm sure there are other more interesting things that go on in the line at the grocery store than that. We want to know stuff. So when Jesus says, you cannot bear them now, it, it just, it makes us kind of scratch our heads and say, what's up with that? Why don't you tell us and let us decide whether we understand it or not? But Jesus knows best. Jesus told us a lot of things that are pretty helpful. He told us to be merciful. He told us to be pure at heart. He told us not to be anxious, be not anxious. Uh, he told us, if anyone wants to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And anybody that takes the Christian faith seriously, and I want to make a comment here, it is fewer and fewer people as we go along. Uh, you know that picking up your cross and following Jesus is a very, very, difficult thing to do. Um, so the reason that we get this text is because Jesus is suggesting to us that after he departs that the Holy Spirit will come and share these things with us. Um, there seemed to be in the first service quite a bit of interest about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God's presence in our lives in a most tangible, intangible way. Um, I'm going to say this for Paul's benefit and I suppose Kristen. She's been his seminary. He's getting ready to start, but... When I was in seminary, I was in a class called Pastoral Care and Counseling. And uh, that class was supposed to teach people like me to be compassionate and caring about people. Uh, 
when I was about, I don't know, 23, 24, when I was in that class, I hadn't learned any of that stuff yet. So they thought, well, we'll give them a class, that'll fix them. Um, which obviously, you know, didn't really take. But uh, we were in class and, and sometimes seminary students get a little cocky. Uh, you know, you go to a seminary class about two weeks and suddenly you're holier than Jesus. And, um, you know, it's, it's kind of disgusting in a way, I guess. Uh, it would be the equivalent of if you went to medical school, somebody being there for two weeks and say, I'm ready for heart surgery. Bring the patient in right now. Um, I would probably be skeptical of somebody that had that degree of confidence operating on me after two weeks of medical school but seminary students can be some, somewhat the same and so one of the students in our class asked a question said uh, or he made a statement he said I can't wait to start visiting people in my church in the hospital because I want to bring God to them and uh my seminary professor, which like all good professors do sometimes when they get a, super, a stupid statement like that, he went and hit himself in the head. And he said, you do not take God to the hospital room. You meet God there. God is already with that patient. You just come to, uh, to represent the congregation and remind that person that our whole congregation cares about you. Um, and what that means is something like this. I went to see uh, Jack Holifer on Friday afternoon. He was in the, the VA home, I guess. It's like a nursing home. And I tried to imagine all of us squeezing into his room, which, to tell you the truth, he would have really enjoyed. But uh, it's not practical. And, and so that's why we have clergy. That's why at some point in my life, a bunch of uh, elders laid their hands on me and said a prayer for me. And what they did was they enabled me to represent you as I do ministry. And I think that that's why when a, uh, I'm trying to decide how, how to say this exactly, but from time to time, clergy, do you know what I'm talking about when I say they step in it? Okay, from time to time when they do that, it's an embarrassment to the church because they represent the congregation. And so not only are they embarrassed themselves and their families, but also they embarrass the church because they have violated a sacred trust. And so that, that's not good at all. And so when we, me, go to a hospital room, I meet God, I meet Jesus, I meet the Holy Spirit that is there trying to help take care of business. Now I'm not going to suggest to you that I have made it clear in any way whatsoever what the business of the Holy Spirit is. But I take some solace in the fact that Augustine, who in my opinion was one of the probably three or four greatest theologians of the Christian church, he wrote a book that is probably 650 or 700 pages in English on the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, how long would your small group or Sunday school class take to get through 700 pages of the doctrine of the Trinity. I can just hope to think of it. So that's why I believe in boiling it down to something a little bit more simple. And we do this in children's sermons from time to time. There was a day in my life that uh, they used to make me do children's sermons against my will. And I would see somebody like Liam over there and I would do a children's sermon with Liam and he would be crawling all over me and 
doing all kinds of unspeakable things to the pastor in front of everyone and much to their delight, as a matter of fact. But uh, I think sometimes when you can explain a doctrine of the church in simple enough language that a three-year-old... Liam, how old are you? You're two? Okay, he'll be three in June, so he'll be 16 in just a couple of years to start driving. <laughs> uh, but if you can explain it to a small child, maybe you have a grip. So I've heard people explain the Trinity in children's sermons like this. It's like an egg. There are three parts to it, but it's really one whole thing. One of my youth ministers one time did was holding an egg in his hand and the kids were giving him a pretty rough time and by the time of the children's sermon he crushed the egg and it just went everywhere that was one of my favorite children's sermons of all time because he literally had egg on his face so i like that uh, another way to explain the trinity is like it's like a three-leaf clover there are three leaves but it's really one thing or it's one thing, and it has three different parts to it, the three leaves. Um, the one that I used to use when they had me do the children's sermon was that the Trinity is like water. It can come to us in different forms. Ice, liquid, or gas, or vapor. And I always thought that was a really good way of doing it. But one of my preaching students at Perkins said, I got something a lot better than that. I thought, yeah, I bet you do. Uh, and he said, the Trinity is like a three, uh, a three in one shampoo. <laughs> There's three different parts, but it does one thing. And I thought to myself, I really don't like to use illustrations that have to do with hair. So, um, so I'm going to stick with the, the water, the vapor, and the ice. So, uh, the Trinity is a doctrine to try to help us understand how God commands us in Scripture, how Jesus walks with us as a uh, brother, and how the Spirit is with us as a constant companion wherever we go and in whatever circumstance we find ourselves. Um, I'm not sure I can get any clearer than that. So, anybody got any questions? Jim, are you okay back there? Okay, he's rubbing his head. Excellent. All right, let us pray. Gracious and merciful God, we ask that as you come and be with us during this next week, that your spirit would give us the strength and the courage to be the disciples you created us to be. We pray this and all things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. I want to, uh, where'd you go? Uh, I want to uh, point out to you that we have uh, collection boxes in the corners and at the back of the church if you want to uh, give your offering in uh, that way. And uh, another way to respond to the spoken word is to uh, unite with uh, Salado United Methodist Church. So while we sing our Last hymn, Lord, I need you. If you'd like to join the church, I'll meet you right down here in the front. Without you, I fall.